I'm sure some people will roll in. Um, it's a shame we can't actually be together in person for this public lecture, but we will make do uh, as we can uh, here on Zoom. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Greg Stevens, today. Uh, Greg has a PhD uh, in general relativity, an area of theoretical physics you may have heard of, uh, but he quickly decided that living organisms offered a much more interesting, perhaps, uh, field of subject uh, compared to the universe as a whole. Uh, and so since his uh, PhD, he's devoted his research efforts uh, to thinking about uh, how living organisms uh, behave and interact with the world uh, across many scales, as you'll see uh, today. He did postdocs at Los Alamos and at Princeton, uh, which is where I first started uh, interacting with Greg. Uh, and he's currently a professor of both at the VU in Amsterdam uh, and the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology. So he spans literally the entire globe uh, with his research groups. Uh, and he has really been a pioneer in thinking about uh, physics-based analyses and a physics-based theory for what animals do all day long. So how you go from observations, looking at what an animal does to understanding what it does. And so I think Yogi Berra said it best when he said, you can learn a lot by watching. And as you will see, Greg has taken this quite a long way uh, with the physics style uh, sort of analysis. Uh, we'll do questions at the end. So please enjoy the talk. And at the end, you can use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, I'll ask you to unmute and Greg will be happy to answer some questions. So with that, I will give the floor to Greg. Take it away and everyone enjoy a wonderful talk. Great, thank you, Josh. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here virtually with all of you. I'm sorry that we can't be in person, but we'll, we'll do the best we can uh, to build this community and to make this community during this talk on Zoom. So uh, as Josh mentioned, I, I want to talk to you about sort of a new uh, sort of endeavor, which isn't just me, but is a, a number of people around the world, including Josh, where we're thinking about sort of quantitative ways of thinking about animal behavior uh, and, and what that means for what we can infer about what's going on inside the animal from their, their genes to their neurons to muscles and everything. And uh, just to give you some orientation for, for the talk, what you're looking at on this title slide is a cartoon done by one of my PhD students of one of the stars of the show today, which is the nematode roundworm Canarhabditis elegans. Uh, C. elegans because nobody likes to say Canarhabditis very often. And the illustration is that uh, this is the double spiral of DNA, double helix of DNA, and we should be able to, with at least simpler animals, to go all the way from molecules to their output behavior. I'll talk to you a lot. I'll talk to you a lot more about that as we go on. Okay. I, I by the way, I have uh, organized this talk to be about forty minutes. So no one gets overly tired with, uh, with, with Zoom and uh, at, at 40 minutes or so, we'll, we should be able to wrap up and have questions. But as Josh mentioned, I didn't start in living systems. I actually started uh, in, um, uh, in quantum gravity, really. Uh, you know, in theoretical physics, unifying general relativity and quantum mechanics is one of the big unsolved questions uh, that we have. But I think the sort of traditional non-living physics and the successes of non-living physics often uh, offer a really interesting challenge for living systems. And let me give you an example of this. So uh, some of you may recognize some of these images. On the, on the left over here, uh, we have a picture of, this is one of the interferometer observatories of the LIGO collaboration. And these are two perpendicular evacuated tubes that are big. They're you know, roughly a kilometer in scale. You send light, a, single, a light beam at the center here is split and it's sent simultaneously down one of these arms and down on the, on another one of these arms. And if a gravitational wave happens to come down from space somewhere and goes through the observatory, these arms will be differentially affected and you can measure that. 
And on the right, one of the modern most famous images from physical review letters is the first detection of gravitational waves from the LIGO observatory, the first direct observation of gravitational waves in general. And um, of course, these gravitational waves come from a fundamental theory of gravity uh, first written or uh, discovered by Einstein. Uh, we've known about the possibility of gravitational waves for quite a while, but they're very weak. Uh, and so I want to point out uh, the units or the size of the deflections that are occurring during one of these gravitational wave events are actually extremely small. Roughly speaking, on the scale of uh, an atomic diameter over this entire apparatus. And it's really only the combination of our, our strong theoretical understanding uh, that allows us to pull out the signature. The, these, this gravitational event uh, could have come from two stars uh, in spiraling into each other. There's lots of other sources that cause vibrations. Could be a bulldozer in the, in the neighborhood somewhere, but we have a strong theory so we can pull we can pull out that signal. And I think that's very impressive. And you know, we'd like to be able to be as precise about what seems to be much harder, the complexity of the living world. That's kind of what, uh, that's kind of the goal of, of our work. But then I also wanted to share with you certainly something that, that happened to me along my, per my particular professional trajectory. And that is, as I started off with these questions of quantum gravity, unifying uh, quantum mechanics and general relativity, which is certainly a fundamental question, you start to ask, well, we have these beautiful, successful theories in physics. Are those theories themselves uh, the uh, fundamental, uh, or simultaneously is it the living system that produced these theories? And of course, that leads you into neuroscience and beyond. Okay. When you think about living systems, there are a tremendous range of scales at which uh, you can think, at which you can work. One of them is the scale of molecules. An important molecule might be the, the molecule DNA that, that carries our heredity. You could work at the scale of cells. For example, there are signaling cells in your brain. These are neurons and we we'll understand the pattern of signals that are produced by the neurons. But I think um, uh, what's, what's, what's unique or important in living systems is how all of this comes together. The molecules, the cells, the networks, genes, neurons, muscles, everything to do something, right? This is the scale of behavior. This is a particular representation of behavior that we, would, we might do after the talk if we were all in Aspen. And it's on this behavioral scale that, you know, this, that consequences are, are kind of evolutionarily important. You find food or you don't find food. You find mates or you don't find mates and you're able to sort of propagate or you're not able to propagate. And certainly there's a lot of effort in imaging of single molecules and imaging of sort of neurons that, that in, in particular animals sort of uh, uh, simultaneously imaging of multiple neurons. But I think it's clear that our understanding of the microscopic in living systems is often much more developed than our understanding of this kind of emergent scale of behavior. And we, including other groups around the world, want to fix that. So we want to be as quantitative and to understand this behavioral scale as well as we understand molecules and cells. Okay, so of course, uh, we're not the first people to think scientifically about behavior. There is a whole field in biology of ethology, or a modern name of ethology would be behavioral ecology. This is the study of behavior in natural context. And this often means studying behavior in the wild. So if you're studying a particular kind of tropical fish, you might go scuba diving with that tropical fish. That's useful because of course, that means you have the animal in its natural environment. So the behavior that you're measuring is reflective of the behavior that, uh, that it evolved, but also that can be very, very challenging. So often, at least historically, this kind of natural behavior was annotated or described by human observers and often by eye. Now your eye is very good at finding at least some kinds of patterns, but of course, it's also important that we can be quantitative about this. 
And actually, there are two founders that I like to uh, of, of ethology. So Conrad, Conrad Lorenz and uh, Nico Timbergen. They shared the Nobel Prize in the 70s, 1973, for, uh, for what they did in ethology. And uh, for those who are keeping track during the talk, this is going to be our first important Lorenz. There's going to be one more. One of the things that we'd like to do is to keep this focus on natural or at least naturalistic behavior, but to add sort of a physics style of quantitative analysis. And that includes sort of very precise measurements. I'll, I'll show you what those mean in a minute. And also the sort of analysis that would, that, that would allow us to think about these behavioral signals quantitatively. And as I said, that's our first meeting with Lorentz. Okay. So let's start thinking quantitatively about behavior. And we could sit around and ponder and ask, what does behavior mean? Of course, it's what animals do, but let's make some progress on that. And a first hint of how to, how to start thinking quantitatively about behavior is to think about posture. Now, this is gonna be obvious to all of you. Posture is incredibly informative, of course, in our human interactions. So here's an example. This is a, a paper that was just published this year uh, from a group in Israel. And in, in the study that they, were, that they did, there was, all, there was one sort of neutral stick figure, maybe a figure like, like this. And then there's a figure where they manipulate the posture using these, uh, these, these angles. And as you can see from the different configurations, uh, there's, you might be able to infer not just, you, well, you might be able to infer sort of the action of, of that particular posture in many, many cases. And in fact, there's many different postures, not every, not all of them, but there's many postures in which if you just, you know, if I, I stay like this, you have a sense of what's going on inside my head. Uh, you could look at these postures and, and they measured actually uh, kind of remarkable agreements among these different posture configurations. And of course, this makes a lot of sense. We all use body language to read the, the, the interior states of people that we're interacting, interacting with. And it's not so surprising then to think that, well, there's a lot of information, not just in the posture of humans, but in the posture of other animals. And we can try to decode that information to learn about why they move the way they move. Okay. now. Traditionally, that's been hard to measure. How do I measure all the angles that make up my human posture? You know, I got, I got little angles here for my fingers. I have joints, wrists, I have elbow. Uh, you could put me in a suit in a, in a green room. You could put markers on my, on my hand. That gets a lot harder if the animals are smaller. And one of the revolutions that I'd like to share with you has sort of been happening over the last three or four years is the ability to train computers and computer vision systems to recognize particular points on the body that give us a sort of a direct readout of the posture of an animal without any sort of intervention in tags or markers or anything. And this is offering a whole new look at how animals, um, at how first the posture and then uh, the behavior. So I think everyone has probably heard about deep networks, convolutional networks, maybe for more for those more technically applied in the audience. I just wanted to give you a very brief sense of how they work because you can see, you know, I'll show you what they do with, with us. But the idea is you have elements in a, in a computer system uh, in, in layers. So here's a, a, a first layer where you have this little element here and it's able to look at a part of this car. For example, the part that's just coming out of the headlight, right? A very small scale look, we'll call it a little filter. And at each layer of this kind of software, this network, you look at sort of higher order features. So you might look not just at, at where, the next layer might look at, at so the conjunction of a headlight with uh, something right above the headlight and so on and so on until at the very at the very end of this network the features are very abstract but the network has learned that well that image is a car i don't show another image and it's a bicycle and these computer vision systems are incredibly powerful. They underlie uh, you know, the image search that you do in Google and so on. And we can put them to remarkable use when it comes to measuring animal behavior. 
And let me just show you the output of, uh, of some of these approaches. So here's an example from our own group. Uh, there are no tags. There's been no physical intervention. This is an, a video taken of an observation beehive. M maybe some of you have seen this in a science museum. It's a quasi two-dimensional plate of a, a honeycomb where the bees make their home, about a thousand bees in this case for the whole hive. And we have been able to train one of these sort of machine vision pipelines, machine vision networks to follow the same bee uh, without any tags. There's no red tag on that bee. That's just something I've, I've put in there for, uh, for your eye. And you'll see that bee goes uh, under other bees. It gets bounced around a lot. And um, it's now, it's not, easy, but it's, it's very possible to do this. Now, of course, you're not just interested in one bee. You want all the bees. If you're going to measure the behavior of a, of a colony, why not measure it all? And this is part of the view of physics, right? If you're going to think about the gas, then you can get, get all the molecules in the gas. These are our, the bees are our gas molecules. We can track them all. Um, and then ask, once we have those trajectories, well, what kind of gas or what kind of crowd what, uh, does, this bee, does this bee colony sort of make? And maybe we can infer different aspects of the colony-wide control. This is a collective superorganism. They all function together for the benefit of the hive. Now, uh, that was work that was done with a, a a fabulous postdoc in our group, Keisha Bojak, and she's now a junior faculty leader in University of Cologne. Um, we don't have to just work on bees. Uh, I'll give you another example. This is one in which Josh is uh, strongly involved as a great collaborator. We are looking at social behavior, in this case, two interacting male zebrafish. You put these two boy fish in a tank and they fight or they interact to establish dominance. And uh, of course, one of the things that you have to do, and this is part of what we mean by physics of behavior, you design experiments that are precise where the imaging is controlled. So we have a, a 40, 40 centimeter cubic tank. We have three cameras. We have a nice uh, close to uniform illumination of this tank. Now it's kind of an artificial environment because fish don't live in a featureless tank like that. But it doesn't really matter for us because you put another fish in the tank and all they seem to care about is the other fish. And what you can see in the right over here are uh, where our, our computer vision system has identified three points per fish, a tail point, a point around the pectoral fin and a point near the head for each fish in all three views, at least as many views as are possible. And it's also kept track of the identity of the fish. So in this image and in the, in the following images, the red fish uh, will always be the fish that wins this dominance contest, contest if it matters. And this is ongoing collaboration with uh, Tatsuo Ozawa, Liam O'Shaughnessy, Josh, as I mentioned, um, throughout. And this is for Oist, Vu, and, um, and Princeton. All right. Now let me show you what they do. Right. These are our fish interacting in the tank. They, they really just hang out with each other. We're doing all kinds of things. We're imaging at 100 frames per second. That's relatively fast. Uh, these contests can last for hours. Usually, we are only recording for 90 minutes, but the contests can last for a while. And of course, there's tons of behavior going on here. Maybe some of this you could identify by eye, at least in broad categories, but certainly not all the different swoops and attacks and so on. And you know, one of the questions that you'd want to know is that the, the uh, important ecological, uh, sort of important evolutionary contest for dominance is what are the fish doing to assess the strength of their partner? At the, I, I won't show you a how this works, but at the end of these many minutes of recording, one of the fish very, very abruptly gives up and decides that it's lost. Uh, and we don't know exactly, we really don't know quantitatively how such a decision is, um, how it comes to be. Okay. So uh, those were some examples where we could get the posture from machine vision. Let, let's switch now to kind of uh, uh, an example where we have a very detailed understanding of its behavior. And this is, again, uh, this nematode worm, round worm, Canarhabditis elegans. It is one of the simplest, if not the simplest animal 
in which to study the integrative, uh, uh, for an integrative study of, of living systems. So everything from genes to neurons, ultimately to behavior. So let me tell you a little bit about this worm. So uh, it was introduced as a model system in genetics uh, by Sidney Brenner, who often also happens to be one of the founders of OIST, where I work. Uh, and Sydney in the 50s was looking for, given the, um, our, uh, the dramatic increases in understanding of heredity and genes, he was looking for an example where you could ask, what, how, how is a nervous system genetically encoded? And this animal, uh, this uh, Canarhyditis elegans, has actually 300 neurons. So uh, if you want to be in the know in the worm community, they, two neurons were just demoted. Uh, it used to be 302, it's now 300. The other two are glial cells, I believe. So um, it has exactly this number, 300. It, all animals have the same number, they're all identified. And that seems like, a, you know, compared to a human brain, for example, where you have 100 billion, this seems like a number that is still complex, but it does seem manageable, right? And I uh, just put uh, Corey Bargman as a, uh, another example of a modern sort of neurobiologist who has thought a lot about how genes and neurons come together to make the behavior of this one. So it's, it's also powerful because there's all kinds of tools. You can manipulate the cell, you can manipulate the genes, you can focus on neurons, you can measure the whole brain. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, you can freeze them, you can, you can do all kinds of things. So um, this is its connectome or a representation of its connectome that is the wiring diagram that connects uh, one neuron to another. Uh, it has about 600 of these connections, or sorry, 6,000 uh, 6, of these connections. You have many, many more. And of course, this would also be a way to study the relevance of, of, that, of those connections. One of the most exciting things, apart from the behavior today, is that you can image the entire brain of this animal at cellular resolution. Again, it almost feels like a physics experiment because you're getting all the parts of the nervous system. If, if you think of the cells, you're getting all the cells or at least all the cells in the, the head ganglion of this, of this animal. You can image their activity uh, sort of in, in its entirety. And there's a lot of people around the world who are doing this at the moment, sort of spearheading, what is it, you know, how do we, how do we think about how all these neurons come together and how do they come together to form behavior? So that's why at the title of the slide, um, as, as was suggested in some conversations here at Aspen, solving C. elegans seems not crazy, right? Uh, in terms of the number of neurons, our access to them, the number of genes, our access to them, and ultimately, of course, our access to behavior. So let's think a little bit about behavior. Now, these, uh, this image goes back to when I first started thinking about C. elegans as a postdoc in Princeton University. These are experiments that were done by a longtime collaborator, William Rue at the University of Toronto. And actually at the time that Will made uh, these experiments, the typical experiment in the fields and people thinking about C. elegans was to put a graduate student in front of a camera, in front of a microscope and just ask them to record when they thought the animal was moving forward, when was it moving backwards, what was the animal doing? And you, you know, there's a lot richer dynamics that are going on in this case. So on the left, you see a silhouette of the, the outline really of the body of the worm as it moves along. It's moving along a two-dimensional surface of an auger plate. That auger plate is what you see in the right. The red square denotes the tracking microscope. So these are only a millimeter long, these little guys. So if you're gonna see them at the scale like you see on the left, you have to use a microscope. That red square denotes the location of this tracking microscope. Will is controlling it automatically, so it follows the worm. And there's a copper ring, which keeps the worm confined to this sort of, in this kind of center region, which is about 10 centimeters. Um, long. And one of the beautiful things about, I think about working on behavior is I can just ask to everyone, including uh, all the physicists in the room and say, write down a model of the posture dynamics that you see here uh, that would fool the worm biologist, right? And that turns out to be a remarkable challenge. So clearly the animal isn't just, isn't just random. There's patterns in the way that it moves. 
but there's a lot of variability and understanding kind of as is typical with living systems they're neither fully disordered nor fully ordered it certainly doesn't look like a robot snake right and and understanding sort of what is the what is the tension between this variability and stereotypy and what kinds of models we should write down uh, that would actually describe that movement is a is a deep question in behavior okay so let's think about now more, more quantitatively in this kind of physics of behavior language, how do we think about posture in the case of the swarm where it is relatively straightforward? So I, I, I talked about those machine vision uh, sort of uh, solutions at the beginning. We don't need those for uh, two-dimensional shapes of the worm, which is nice. So if I think about one of those silhouette images and I wanna quantify the shape, now, as long as the width of the animal isn't changing or the length of the animal isn't changing very much, which is approximately true, then the shape that you see in the silhouette is well characterized by this red curve, the center line curve. There is no, no, no spine or, or skeleton to the animal. This is an abstraction that we draw on top of this image. And, I, and I've noted the head. It's important that we keep these ordered from head to tail. But that's really what the posture of this animal means from the image. And it's really relatively straightforward to, uh, to extract those curves from uh, clean data such as Will's. And what does that mean quantitatively? It means that I pull out this red curve. How do I quantify that curve? I tell you locally at a number of points along the curve, let's say 100 points along the curve, I just tell you the local bending angle, which I denote as theta. So if you tell me all these local bending angles, then you can reconstruct this curve. All right. And um, that's what we do. All right. So on the right, you see that's real data. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit noisy. In fact, uh, what you see, though, are the angles for this, for this center line curve. And there's 100 of them uh, rather arbitrarily because we, just, we put 101 points along the center line of this curve. We wanted enough that we wouldn't miss anything. You see some high frequency noise, which is just coming from the fact that ultimately these images are made of pixels. But mostly what you, you, you're drawn to is these two humps, which are these, uh, these broad curves in, um, in the worm. Okay, and you get one of these. This is kind of a this is a multi-dimensional encoding of posture. It has the advantage, by the way, of throwing away things that we're not interested in. We're not interested in all these pixels, so those get thrown away. We're not interested, at least in this analysis, in which way the worm is pointing. Its overall orientation doesn't matter. Nor are we interested in um, its location within the image. Everything that we're interested in is this intrinsic posture, and this we capture with these with these angles. Now, uh, so you get one of these. So for every one of these images, the worm posture is just this collection of bending angles along the center line curve. And there's an immediate uh, re uh, problem that you also face, which is I want you to think a little abstractly. Every one of these dots represents an image which represents which we which we encode as a posture in this uh, space of angles so this would be at time at one time here's another time right and this is just like you so if if you're sitting like this you have one set of postures that are describing all the joint angles at some other time maybe you move your hands and you go to a different point and over the collection of your day so over the collection of many many samples for the worm you get a whole cloud of these points and that cloud then then traces out sort of the space of posture that the worm naturally inhabits and uh, in the title I, I say all animal of this slide all animals posture is lower dimensional what i mean is that you never or or uh, very uncommon for you to use all the possible joint angles uh, kind of independently, right? You have patterns to your motion. The worm has patterns to its motion. And one way to see these patterns is, is that, and I'm not going to tell you where these come from for, for today, but I can talk about that offline or uh, at the end of the talk. This space of worm posture is spanned by only four kind of typical directions in the space of posture. So we call these eigenworms. 
Uh, technically, they come as eigenvectors of a matrix. So that, that's where the name comes from. And what it means is that to reconstruct any one of these shapes, uh, all I need to tell you is kind of the basis set of eigenworms, which is pretty universal across all worms, across conditions. It doesn't change that much. And then I tell you sort of the projections along each one of these special eigenworms. It's a little bit like Fourier analysis, if, if you know what that means. Okay. And this result, while, while the eigenworms are, of course, specific to the worm, this idea that po you know, the postures that you actually use are, are kind of much lower dimensional than your space of possible postures, than your spatial possible, possible movements is, of course, very general. It's true across animals. And that makes our life as analysts much easier because now we can think about a much lower dimensional space of, uh, of posture. And let me show you how that works. Okay, here's what the eigenworms do. So what you see in the movie is different, is different. Amplitudes of the eigenworms first done independently and now done jointly just with A1 and A2. Now this is totally artificial. We're doing a sign, I'm just inputting a sine wave on the first two modes. But what you already see is that even with a low number of these projections, uh, superposition of a small number of things can give rise to almost complex looking behavior. And in fact, um, that, that is kind of one of the lessons from this is what looks to be complex in that movie that I showed you at the very beginning with the, with the worm actually could be a superposition of much simpler things. Okay? Uh, and what, what the, why that's good for us as, uh, as people who analyze this, these dynamics is that, so here's an example, here's a worm on the right, and here's the three-dimensional space of the first three most important eigenworm postures. What you're seeing is a response called an escape response. Uh, it's, it's when the worm moves away from a stimulus, it does something called an omega turn, all kinds of nice dynamics going on in, in this space that we'd like to quantify. Uh, and what that means uh, really on the right is that we have a three-dimensional time series and now we look at the sort of characteristics of that time series. Okay. Uh, so that was really about posture uh, and the story that I told you kind of works time and, time and again, even for much more kind of intricately uh, connected animals, but what about behavior? Because behavior is how you change your posture. So now we meet our second Lorenz of the story. This is Edward Lorenz. He was a meteorologist uh, and also one of the founders of what we call uh, chaotic dynamics, chaotic dynamical systems. And maybe some of you have seen this very famous, it's called an attractor, it's a particular dynamical uh, sort of result of a set of equations that we now call the Lorentz equations. Uh, and they are chaotic. You wouldn't be able to tell by eye, but uh, if you put two points uh, nearby on this space and let them go with very close initial conditions, they will separate very quickly. The equations that govern this kind of attractor are very simple, actually. So uh, you don't have to worry too much about what these equations mean, but just in the space of possible equations, there's not thousands of terms here, right? There's only three. And yet it gives rise to, that was one of the lessons of this kind of, uh, these kinds of dynamics. In fact, these equations emerged as a reduction of the much more complicated motion of our atmosphere. But one of the conclusions is that sometimes simple rules are all you need for complex behavior. Sometimes you need complex rules for complex behavior, but it might be that simple rules can also suffice, okay? And we were interested in this kind of analogy for steel again. So uh, we didn't know the equations, like we don't have our version of equations like Lorentz had for the Lorentz attractor. So we have to seek those, we have to seek the relevant degrees of freedom in the time series of postures. And we have a particular technical way of doing that where we have combinations of our measured variables, these eigenworms over time, they maximize our short term prediction. And for those who are techni technically uh, uh, enabled in the audience, this is called an embedding. Uh, one of these embeddings, if it's a good embedding, it can capture what we need from the equations of motion, even if we don't have the equations of motion. And when we do it in the case of C. elegans, we find something pretty nice. That is, uh, by learning these predictive variables from the dynamics of the posture, we find what underlies the behavior 
is a combination of seven primitive motifs that characterize the worm's behavior. And these motifs we call the seven predictive variables of worm locomotion. And they are remarkably interpretable. So the, there's two here on the left that characterize a wave that moves down the body. So this is a body position. This is the curvature along the body and over time in the vert vertical direction. So when you see uh, something move down like this in time, that's a wave traveling down the worm's body. So this is forward locomotion. You sort of see the opposite in these other two modes. These are reversal modes. So this is when the worm sort of switches into a reversal gear. This is reversal locomotion. And then there are three more broad waves that don't have as well-defined dynamics, but are certainly involving more of the body. They, they, they have less um, zero crossings. And these three variables correspond to the worm making these deep turns, uh, including the, the turns that you saw during the escape response. And they're really, you know, the, the behavior that we see on the, on the agar plates without food is well described by these seven, these seven variables. Okay. Now, uh, just, to, just to reinforce the interpretability of these variables, and uh, I'm sorry, the, the X should be a gamma. So these are the seven variables. So these are the two forward gammas. And I'm, we're measuring now the velocity of the worm, so kind of its centroid velocity. So, so uh, when it's moving forward, it's red, and that's this sort of circle-looking uh, set of trajectories. When it's moving backward, it's blue. That's these circle-looking uh, uh, trajectories and when it's turning, uh, it's uh, either dark, uh, dark red or dark blue over here among these three modes. And we could go back and look at these uh, these seven variables in terms of this escape response, and and everything looks very interpretable, which is nice. Uh, and they do more than that. I'm going to skip this. Sorry, they do more than that. Uh, that kind of just gets to the heart of my of my talk, and that is that the dynamics, the particular trajectories that we see in, uh, in, the, in these seven, bears, seven variables are actually quite remarkable. So let me describe this conceptually. If you started, we, we can't really do this, we haven't really done this exact experiment, but you can sort of do this analytically. So if you start two worms, you pick two worms that are very close in this seven-dimensional reconstructed embedded space, and you let them go. So there's two worms here, but you can't really tell because they're right on top of each other. And it means that not only is their posture the same, but their, their dynamics are the same. Their velocities and posture are also the same. And they will stay together for a little while, but they will eventually diverge. And this divergence happens pretty quickly. So uh, roughly on the scale of a, between a half to one second, okay? And if you measure that divergence, well, how, how do nearby worm postures diverge away from each other? They diverge exponentially. That's a signature of systems like the chaotic Lorentz system. You can measure the rate of that divergence with something called the maximum Lyapunov exponent. It doesn't matter what it's called. The fact that it's non-zero, the fact that these animals diverge gives you, a, in a particular exponential way, gives you a hint that there's something interesting going on in the dynamics. Uh, there's a lot more interesting things going on in the dynamics. This is much more technical than I think most people need to, need to think about. But just to say that by measuring uh, the exponents in the full seven-dimensional space of, of these variables, we learn a lot about what might be the, uh, the right model for warm locomotion. So they seem like they're chaotic. And what does that mean? One of the things that means is that we can think about the worms moving around on this plate as transitioning among a number of different cycles, which I've sketched here kind of qualitatively. So there's a forward cycle, set of cycles, really. And we call these set of cycles unstable periodic orbits. They're unstable because the system is chaotic. And so you would naturally, as a worm, without any control whatsoever, and just in this chaotic system, you would naturally stay here for a while, bouncing from one forward cycle to another, and then you might bounce to a reversal cycle. You might bounce, oh, sorry, reversal cycle over here in the purple, then you might bounce to a red cycle. And so this really suggests a picture of the worm's behavior in which it kind of uh, it wanders among these, these different cycles. And in fact, 
You can do much more than that. You can go and look for these cycles, identify them, uh, uh, reconstruct parts of the dynamics that come from them, and, and everything seems to seems to match, right? So we have this picture of chaos coming from the work. Okay, I didn't want to go too long, um, so I want to come to kind of a, a conclusion, right? There's a lot more to come in in groups, not just in our work, but from groups from around the world where we're thinking about behavior in this new posture-driven high-resolution manner. So in this quantitative richness of animal behavior, which was previously largely uh, explored by I, there are unexplored patterns, there's, there's meaning that we don't know. And I think one of the takeaways, uh, both at the level of experiments and also at the level of analysis, is that if you slow down, you know, in this case, you see, uh, you see these two fish, we've slowed them down to about a 20th of the normal speed. And you look carefully, you see they're, they're, they're doing all kinds of crazy headbutting during this video, but you could also look carefully in the trajectories of the worms. They're not just random. So if you look carefully and you characterize what you see quantitatively, then uh, there's a lot to learn uh, about behavior. And we're just getting started. And I want to thank you for uh, your patience as I, I sort of explored and explained a little bit about what we do in the physics of behavior. So thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Greg. I will clap for everyone else. <laughs> um, at this point, we can take some questions. If you use the raise hand button at the bottom, I will ask you to unmute and then feel you can ask Greg a question and he will uh, give you an entertaining answer, uh, hopefully. So uh, please take it away. I love this new fish movie, Greg. Thank you. For <laughs> I thought you would. <laughs> I hadn't seen this one yet. Uh, but Greg didn't tell you that we built this crazy giant 3D fish tank <laughs> that lives in Okinawa, which is pretty cool. So any, uh, we have one question. Barbara, please uh, unmute and uh, feel free to ask Greg your question. Uh, hello, this is uh, <clears throat> Barbara's husband, Michael. And um, I thank you for the effort that you put into this presentation, I'm wondering what its implications are for understanding the social behavior and the, and the meaning of same um, of, of animals, like for instance, <clears throat> dolphins and whales, um, they probably communicate somehow with their postures and their behaviors. Um, can this um, process that you've unveiled help us understand um, the correlation between the postures and behaviors and the social aspects of these animals? Yeah, so, so thank you for your question. Absolutely. Uh, Josh and I really got interested in this, in the system that you're looking at on the screen now precisely because it's a rich social behavior that we think we can we can access quantitatively, and not only are the, the dynamics that you see on the screen uh, pretty interesting, but that's far from all that's happening. So the fish uh, during this contest are changing the they're changing the erectness of their fins. They're trying to make themselves we think look larger. Again, that's qualitative. They are changing the the um, the contrast of their stripes they're making their stripes stand out more and all of this is is you know to to provide evidence to the other fish about about their strength at least we think so um, uh, we, there's a lot more we have to learn about social behavior I think that that this way of approaching it gets to the questions that you are addressing and and uh, that, that we're all interested in, that, that almost get all the way to the cognitive science in humans, but from the ground up, from a, from a data-driven kind of uh, strong precision experiment and analysis fashion. So yeah, thank you for the question. Well, thank you. I have one follow-up question. Is that okay? It's fine for me, moderator. Yeah. Um, okay, I was wondering, your experimental techniques, are they derived from machine vision? 
and are they feeding back into improving machine vision? Uh, Mike, our experimental techniques are Josh and, and Tatsuo. So uh, <laughs> what? We, we collaborate. This is a beautiful example of one of the things that I think is very common in physics, maybe less common in biology, where experiments and theorists collaborate together. So I, I don't know if you want to take that one, Josh. I, I don't think our goal is to really come back onto machine vision per se, but to, but to be able to understand the behavior here. Yeah, I, let's, let's move on to the next question. Uh, Andreas has his hand raised, so please unmute and feel free to ask your question. Yeah, hi, I'm watching from Chile. Th thanks a lot for a great talk. Sure, great. Um, I was wondering, um, is it possible to, under, or, or, or do you have any ideas of how to understand, for example, these eigenworms, the shapes of the eigenworms, or the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the seven patterns of behavior in terms of the physical structure of the worm or something like that? Yeah, that's a great question, absolutely. So uh, you can see what I explained to you today was this sort of, data-driven understanding of what we see. But there's, a, there's another side to this, which is, are there simple biomechanical control models that you could write down that would agree? So we did the data-driven analysis first because it sets the stage for what kind of results your biomechanical theory should actually reveal. But now we're doing the other side and I, I, we don't have an answer just yet, but it looks very promising. So I think a relatively simple model, the body mechanics with a simple controller will explain, uh, could explain, has the potential to explain the, the dynamics that we see. Absolutely. And that's a really good direction that we're going. Great. Looking forward to that. Okay. I don't see any more hands. We have one comment which I'll read because it's quite cute. It says, wow, what a great lecture. If this field of applied physics had been available 40 years ago, I might have continued my physics aspirations before veterinary school. So uh, <laughs> thank you exponentially, Greg. And I think uh, it doesn't, oh, there's one more question. Henry Greenside, Henry. please unmute and ask your question. Uh, Greg, I hope you're doing well. It's been way too long since I've had the pleasure of talking with you. I greatly enjoyed your talk. Um, I, I had two questions. One is, you mentioned earlier in your talk that people can now map out the activity of all the C. elegans by neurons by optical techniques. Has anyone yet correlated that result with your eigenworms and determined whether there's a low dimensional neural modes in the nervous system, the C. elegans that's coinciding with these, this low dimensional behavioral mode? And the other yeah, question, yeah. which might be too technical, is how do you know that the chaotic behavior of the C. elegans was chaotic as opposed to just noise-driven transitions from one basin to another? Okay, great. So let, let me do those questions separately. So, so one is uh, Andy Leifer and Josh, uh, in collaboration with others, uh, have, uh, I think, are, are one of the only groups in the world who are doing moving imaging, you know, imaging of the the neural dynamics of C. elegans at cellular res resolution while the animal is moving. There's, uh, there's some low dimensional behavior. Uh, I think if, in, when the worm, yeah, I, I think that story is still kind of unfolding at the moment, but I have every, every belief that there will be a connection with the low dimensional uh, dynamics of the eigenworms. Um, the, the second question is, is also super astute. That is, how do we know that the, the dynamics that we see, this sort of intricate chaotic dynamics that we seem to see in the trajectories of C. elegans aren't just kind of noise? And I alluded to it when I flashed this Lyapunov spectrum on uh, uh, quickly on a slide, the structure of the trajectories just doesn't make sense uh, with any models of noise that we know. You, you have an almost Hamiltonian structure of the Lyapunov exponents. And to Andreas's question before, we really think that's coming from elastic body, uh, so the elastic body mechanics of the, of the body wall. So there's absolutely still room for noise, but uh, in the, and also in the, in the unstable periodic orbits, 
uh, it doesn't seem like the, the noise picture is really parsimonious with, uh, with the analysis that we're seeing. So that was a little bit of a surprise, by the way, right? I think your first intuition might be that, well, it's just, it's kind of this noisy process. But of course, even in that case, you have to explain, well, where, you know, how do you transition from one behavior to another? And our answer, at least in this chaotic landscape, is you don't really think about it. It just happens naturally from the dynamics. Thank you very much. And again, I enjoyed your talk. Great. Uh, the chat asks, what are the next living organisms plan for your analyses? Oh, that's easy. Well, we have a lot more to do with fish. I think Josh and I are both super thrilled. But uh, just to whet your appetite, Josh has a bunch of organisms. We are, we are on, we're adding squid. You want a crazy organism. Uh, you can, because we sit in Okinawa and uh, the waters are teeming with interesting organisms. So uh, squid in Okinawa are social. They interact, they form groups uh, in space, but they also interact, we think, visually uh, through their skin patterning and the combination of posture and skin patterning and local structure in their, what seems to be a three-dimensional structure of the group is uh, kind of totally unexplored. So. We can take a lot of the techniques that you're watching for the fish and apply them to squid. And that's a complicated uh, invertebrate uh, brain and who knows what we're gonna find. Great. Any more questions? And if not, I think we can wrap this up. I believe this video will be on the Aspen Center uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so feel free to tell your friends and relatives, watch it over and over. Reruns of Greg are fantastic. Uh, and it was a great talk. So uh, we can all clap. He won't hear you, but we should clap anyway. So that was a fantastic talk. Thank you, Greg. Uh, and everyone have a wonderful evening. If you're in Aspen, enjoy it. It's a special place. And if you're not, you know, as we say at Passover, uh, next year in Aspen or something like that. Okay. Great. Thank Bye, you. Everyone. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Thank you.